Welcome to the Medal of Honor induction ceremony in honor of Staff Sergeant Ryan M. Pitts. Sergeant Pitts was awarded our nation's highest and most prestigious award for valor by the President of the United States, the Medal of Honor. This morning, he will formally be inducted into the Pentagon's most sacred place, the Hall of Heroes. Our hosts for today's ceremony are the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Robert Work, the Secretary of the Army, the Honorable John M. McHugh, the Chief of Staff of the Army, General Ray Odierno, and the Sergeant Major of the Army, Ray Chandler. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the singing of our national anthem by Sergeant First Class Pablo Talamante and the invocation which will be delivered by Chaplain Donald L. Rutherford. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming, and the rock and regular the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the home of the And let us pray. Heavenly Father, today we honor Staff Sergeant Ryan Pitts for his marvelous combat actions. Truly, he holds the loyalty he expressed to his team, the humility with which he accepts this honor we bestow upon him from our great nation. By his bravery shown in the battlefield and through his values, actions, and works, he epitomized the Army profession and our warrior ethos. The hour and valley of the shadow of death remained faithful and tenacious to fight on, even after being wounded. It truly holds dear the memory of the men with whom he fought. We join with him in honoring their service and sacrifice for our nation. May your presence abide with us this day in this ceremony. As we pray together in your holy name, amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chief of Staff of the Army. Good morning, everyone. It's my distinct pleasure to be here today to honor Staff Sergeant Ryan Pitts, who joins a rare fraternity of military service members who have displayed extraordinary acts of valor during exceptional circumstances with great risk to their own personal safety. Staff Sergeant Pitts embodies the essence of a soldier and represents what every man and woman who dons this uniform strives to be. An individual who has earned the trust of all with whom he associates. One who possesses a humility and selflessness that we all respect one who embraces esprit de corps and routinely demonstrates a dedication to his profession that epitomizes the ethos of the American soldier. In the face of imminent danger, he always put his mission first. He never quit. He never accepted defeat. And above all else, 
He never left his fallen comrades. Today we are here to honor Staff Sergeant Pitts, but we must never forget the sacrifices of the nine soldiers lost on July 13, 2008 at Vehicle Patrol Base Kaler in OP Topside. We remember PFC Sergio S. Abad, Corporal Jonathan R. Ayers, Corporal Jason M. Bogar, First Lieutenant Jonathan P. Brostrom, Sergeant Israel Garcia, Corporal Jason D. Havitar, and Corporal Matthew P. Phillips, Corporal Pruitt A. Rainey, and Corporal Gunnar W. Swilling. We also remember Sergeant First Class Matthew Kaler, Sergeant Pitts' platoon sergeant who was killed in action on January 26, 2008, after whom the vehicle patrol base was named. We are honored to have some of their family members with us today. We will never forget the dedication, commitment, and sacrifice of your husband, son, brother, or grandson. Would the family members please stand and be recognized at this time? I would also like to welcome with us today Senator Shaheen from New Hampshire, Senator Kelly Aylott from New Hampshire, Representative Ann Custer from the 2nd District of New Hampshire, Deputy Secretary of Defense Robert Work, Secretary of the Army John McHugh, General Retired Gordon Sullivan, the 32nd Chief of Staff of the Army, Sergeant Major of the Army Ray Chandler, our other Assistant Secretaries of the Army, General Officers, Sergeant Majors, other distinguished guests from our Department of Defense and Army leadership that are joining us here today. I'd also like to rec uh, recognize Medal of Honor recip recipients, Colonel Retired Harvey Barnum, Barnum Jr., First Lieutenant Retired Brian Thacker, and Staff Sergeant Retired Kyle White. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to Sergeant Pitts' family and friends, his wife Amy, his son Lucas, his grandmother Kathleen, father and mother-in-law Michael and Claudette, and his brother Scott. And it's also appropriate that we recognize the members and leaders of Chosen Company, 2nd Battalion, 503rd Infantry Regiment from the 173rd Airborne Brigade Combat Team Sky Soldiers who are here with us today. All of us who wear this uniform understand the personal nature of combat and the complete reliance we have on our brothers and sisters in arms. And your presence today reinforces these strong bonds formed under extraordinary conditions. And that's who determines who we are as soldiers, the bonds that are formed during the most difficult times. And it's incredibly appropriate that you are all here today and we're proud of your service and all that you've done. So would you please all stand and be recognized at this time. In combat, you never know what each day might bring. What you do know is that you must always be ready, mentally and physically. But some days are simply very different than others. 
That day for Sergeant Pitts and elements of Chosen Company were very different. In the early morning twilight, insurgents moved into fighting positions overlooking vehicle patrol base, base Kaler, an observation post topside, which was about 100 meters above the patrol base. Sergeant Pitts, the forward observer, was manning OP topside with a team of eight others. That morning, soldiers at the vehicle patrol base identified enemy fighters on a hillside east of Wanat. As Sergeant Pitts and Sergeant Matthew Gobble prepared a request for indirect fire, an estimated 200 insurgents lost, launched a full-scale assault. The attack began with a volley of machine gun fire from a two-story building on a terraced hill, but quickly swelled into an all-out assault with machine guns, rocket-propelled grenades, and hand grenades thrown at very close range. Within minutes, everyone at OP topside was wounded, and several were killed. And that was just from the first volley of fire. Sergeant Pitts received grenade shrapnel to both legs and his left arm. Sergeant Pitts was thrown toward the northern position in a blast. Seeking cover, he crawled to the southern end of the observation post. There, Corporal Jason Bogar applied a turning it to his right leg. Specialist Tyler Stafford informed him that the northern position was destroyed and Corporal Matthew Phillips and Corporal Gunnar Swilling had both been killed. Sergeant Pitts immediately returned to the northern position where grenades were stored. With enemy fighters moving up to take the OP, he threw grenades into the draw just beyond the perimeter to the north holding each grenade after the pin was pulled and the safety lever was released to allow nearly an immediate detonation. Between tossing grenades, Sergeant Pitts updated the company commander, Captain Matthew Meyer, of casualties in enemy locations. To conserve hand grenades, Sergeant Pitts grabbed the M240B machine gun. Unable to stand, Sergeant Pitts blind fired the machine gun to provide momentary cover, then propped himself up on his knees. Within minutes of this initial report to Captain Meyer, the enemy forces destroyed the tow system in the 120 millimeter mortar firing pit below. At this point, Sergeant Pitts was the only, was the only contact between the command post and OP topside. And the only person left capable of controlling indirect fire support from FOD blessing onto targets around his position. Against overwhelming enemy fires, First Lieutenant Jonathan Brostrom maneuvered an element from the patrol base to the OP. On arrival, Sergeant Pitts gave Lieutenant Brostrom a situation report. Taking Corporal Pruitt, Pruitt Rainey's M4 with a mounted M203 grenade launcher, Sergeant Pitts continued to send requests for indirect fire while Lieutenant Brostrom, Corporal Josen Hovatar, and Corporal Bogar and Corporal Rainey moved to defensive positions. Minutes later, Sergeant Pitts realized that no other fires were coming from the OP. He crawled silently from his position to the sudden perimeter to discover that he was alone. Losing blood, Sergeant Pitts radioed Captain Meyer to inform him that he was the last man. Insurgents were in such close proximity to Sergeant Pitts that soldiers at the command post could hear enemy voices over the radio. But Sergeant Pitts did not quit. Thinking his position would soon be overrun, he was determined to do as much damage as possible to the enemy. Taking the M203 grenade launcher, Sergeant Pitts began firing it directly overhead sending grenades just beyond the perimeter. Over the radio, Sergeant Pitts called for anyone with a line of sight to begin firing over his position. Sergeant Brian Hissung at the casualty collection point below answered the call and laid down fire directly over Sergeant Pitts. While Sergeant Hissung provided suppressive fire, Staff Sergeant Sean Samir Samaru, Sergeant Israel Garcia, Specialist Michael Denton and Specialist Jacob Sones moved 
from the traffic control point to the OP. Their special sona has treated Sergeant Pitt's injuries with another round when another round of explosives mortally wounded Sergeant Garcia. Sergeant Pitts crawled to Sergeant Garcia and comforted him, comforted him until being moved from the open to the OP southern end. Sergeant Pitts, nearly unconscious, radio Captain Meyer. They needed feedback to direct the first helicopter attack run on insurgents only 30, me 30 meters north of the OP. This allowed soldiers at the vehicle patrol base to move a third group of reinforcement up the terraces. After fighting for nearly two hours, Sergeant Pitts was medically evacuated and the OP was secured. Sergeant Pitts' incredible physical and mental toughness, his determination and resilience, and his ability to communicate with leadership while under heavy fire allowed U.S. forces to hold the OP and turn the tide of the battle. Today, we induct Staff Sergeant Pitts into the Hall of Heroes. He has demonstrated unco uncommon valor and extraordinary courage under fire. His competence, his commitment to his fellow soldiers, unit, and the mission, and his incredible character epitomizes the Army profession and the best of what our soldiers and our Army represents. I am moved by Staff Sergeant Pitt's humility, his selflessness, and his respect for his fellow soldiers. This combined with his gallantry, courage, and determination under chaotic conditions separate him from others. His lasting legacy will be of all those he has influenced by his actions. We honor Staff Sergeant Pitts, a man of courage and conviction. But by honoring him, we also honor those heroes who fought so selflessly by his side. The bonds formed in combat between our brothers and sisters are everlasting and difficult to describe to someone else. But it's that inspiration that drives ordinary soldiers to do extraordinary things. And on this day, a group of ordinary soldiers did extraordinary things. The strength of our nation is our army. The strength of our army is our soldiers. The strength of our soldiers is our families. And that's what makes this army strong. Thank you for all coming today and going to America. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of the Army. Good morning. It's a great day for the United States of America. ceremonies in this special hall and it always looks wonderful but at no time does it look as special as it does on these kinds of occasions at no time does it look so beautiful and pretty understandably so so thank you all so much for coming chief sergeant major miss chandler Mr. Secretary, thank you, yes, for being here today to share some thoughts with us, but equally so for what you do each and every day for our men and women in uniform of all uh, of the services. And I want to add my words of welcome to a good share of the New Hampshire Congressional Delegation here today, Senator Ayad, Senator Shaheen, and of of course, uh, Representative uh, Custer, uh, thank you for, again, as you did yesterday at the White House, sharing in this uh, special, special moment. And the Chief noted some very special individuals as well, the members, past and present of Chosen Company, 
2nd Battalion Airborne, 503rd Infantry Regiment, 173rd ABCT, The Chosen Few, Ryan's former outfit. They are a storied bunch of soldiers, and we are deeply honored to have them here today, particularly the 36 who were on the ground that day at Wanat, and the 16 aviators who were also here that on that day provided close air support and medevac services. And we have asked them to stand, but I would ask all of us again to recognize them with an incredibly deserved round of applause. It is always wonderful that present Medal of Honor awardees join in these ceremonies to welcome a new member into their ranks. And as the chief rightly noted, we are again blessed to have three such individuals. Marine uh, Colonel Harvey Barnum, former Army First Lieutenant Brian Thacker, and former uh, Army Staff Sergeant Kyle White. Uh, Gentlemen, as always, your presence uh, and your welcoming uh, arms are so very important. To the former Chief of Staff of the Army, Gordon Sullivan, sir, thank you for your service in the past and what you continue to do, especially for the men and women and families of this United States Army. Now, I need to state the obvious. We would not have an event we would not, in all likelihood, have a hero were it not for the love and support that Staff Sergeant Pitt has received from his family and friends, principally his Amy, Amy, his wife, uh, their little boy Lucas, who is happily in, indulging in a bottle, <laughs> and we hope it lasts throughout the ceremony. The continued love of Ryan's grandmother, Kathleen, Ryan's brother, Scott, his, Amy's parents, uh, all of the good folks who have joined, uh, not just in this moment, but have joined him throughout his entire life. And I want each of you to recognize that we recognize each of you in your own unique and important ways has helped make Ryan the hero he has become. And as we heard at the White House yesterday, Amy and Ryan celebrated yesterday their second wedding anniversary. Uh, the president, wise man that he is, gave Ryan some wise advice, even though the anniversary and the awarding of the Medal of Honor happened on the same day. He told them, don't rest on your laurels. You gotta continue to do better. So I know you wanna follow commander in chief and uh, just a little hint, there's a very nice jewelry store right here in the Pentagon. <laughs> you might want to take Amy there, put something historic around her neck, perhaps. And that'll help make the president's recommendation come true. To the good folks of Nashua, New Hampshire, welcome. Population 86,933. I suspect that number significantly diminished here today, but uh, I've been in Nashua. It's a great community. It's not unlike my hometown, on Watertown, kind of nestled against the Canadian border, in northern New York. And I know in Nashua, like we do in Watertown, you have four seasons, almost winter, winter, still winter, and uh, pothole repair season. And the folks who call Northern Virginia home think that they have it good, but I'll tell you, those brave folks from New Hampshire have more miles on their snowblowers than most of you do on your cars. So we are, we are thrilled that you are here 
and sharing in this special moment. As the chief has said, the Battle of Wanat was as ferocious as it was heroic. It was one of the bloodiest battles of the Afghan war, and yet while it was surely a place of unspeakable sadness, it was also a place of incomprehensible valor. It's a place where honor and courage and conviction never wavered where commitment to one's fellow soldiers was paramount, where, as Ryan has described, valor was everywhere. But consistent gallantry has always been a historical landmark of this great U.S. Army and the unselfish men and women whom we are so blessed to have fill its ranks. And as all of us know, the true strength of America's Army is today as it's always been, not in our hardware, not in our high-tech weaponry or secret programs, but it lies instead in our soldiers, our volunteer soldiers, soldiers like Ryan. So it is incumbent upon all of us, the living, the beneficiaries to draw new strength, to draw inspiration, from the gallantry and the selfless service displayed by Ryan and his teammates. And as the chief noted, that's especially true of the nine fearless soldiers who fell and the 27 others who were wounded that terrible day. Our hearts, again, go out to their loved ones, and as you've seen, many of whom are with us here this morning. Their sacrifices, require from us an equal and unending devotion to their memory and to their cause. It requires the respect, the honor, the glory they have so richly earned through their sacrifice. And again, I'd ask that you extend to these people who have laid upon the altar the greatest sacrifice, the lives of their loved ones, or overdue round of applause. In James Michener's book, The Bridges of Toko Ri, he writes of an officer waiting through the night for the return of warplanes to an aircraft carrier as dawn is coming on. And he asks simply, where do we find such men? And I often ask myself a somewhat similar question uh, when I look out over an assembly of gathered soldiers, particularly a pre-deployment ceremony. Where do we find such men? Where do we find such women? President Reagan really answered the question when he said we find them where we've always found them. They are the product of the freest society man has ever known. They make a commitment to the military, make it freely because the birthright we share as Americans is worth defending. At the Battle of Wanat, we found them in places like Aia, Hawaii, Long Beach, California, in Snellville, in Jasper, Georgia, in Seattle, Washington, in Clinton, Tennessee, in Haw River, North Carolina, in Florissant, Missouri, and in Morganfield, Kentucky, the hometowns of the Nine Fallen, the names you heard the chief speak the names that can never be spoken too often. Jonathan P. Brostrom, Israel Garcia, Jonathan Ayers, Matthew B. Phillips, Jason M. Bogar, Jason D. Hovader, Pruitt A. Rainey, Gunnar W. Zwilling, and Sergio S. Abad. All of them in their 20s, the oldest, 
27. The youngest, just 20. Brothers in arms, men who lovingly served a cause truly greater than themselves, men who, as Ryan has said, truly considered themselves a family, at times a dysfunctional family perhaps, just like really most of our families. But as Ryan has described, these men were committed to one another. They were committed to their uncommon lives and equally their common challenge. And just like any true family, love and trust laid at the heart of it all. Now it might seem odd to some to speak the words of love and trust when recounting the brave and bold actions of such rough and tumble warriors. But make no mistake, their love for each other was real, even as it was in the midst of indescribable chaos. To be sure, on the day of the one odd attack, Ryan Pitts was wearing the KI bracelet, bearing the name of Sergeant First Class Matthew Kaler. As you heard, a platoon sergeant of the second platoon who had died just months earlier. Ryan unabashedly says that Kaler loved his soldiers, each and every one of them, loved them like they were his own kids. Of that, I have no doubt. At the height of the Battle of Wenat, Specialist Michael Denton and three other soldiers scrambled out the bullet rock terraces of OP topside to reinforce the position, where, as the chief told you, Ryan had been fighting alone, fighting off the enemy single-handed. Ryan had no idea the four were coming. The scene was awful, Denton later recalled. He found the body of his best bud specialist, Jason Hovader, lying there lifeless. Denton said, I took ammo from Hovader's body, and I told him I loved him. He told him he loved him. Denton then went on to man a machine gun. Moments later, after another barrage of RPGs tore into the OP, wounding all five of the men, Sergeant Israel Garcia lie mortally wounded. Ryan pulled his close friend to him, his brother. And knowing there was nothing he could do for him, he just laid there and he held his hand. We just talked for a while, Ryan said. He told me he wanted me to tell his mom and wife that he loved them. Ryan later honored that commitment. So, through all of the chaos, through all of the destruction, we can truly see the love, even in the face of such tragedy, bonds these men and their families. And believe it or not, just as it is on the home front, love and trust are the foundations of this incredible professional army. Not surprisingly, today's soldiers trust each other. They trust the army and those who fill its ranks. And they also understand the moral dimensions of war. I've heard the chief speak often about the issue of trust. It is, as he said, the backbone of our professional army. It's what defines our profession of arms. Ryan has said he trusted everyone around him, that he'd follow his officers anywhere, that he knew help would come if humanly possible. He knew it because he knew he would do the same. He trusted the skills of the Apache pilots who flew and fired danger close to his embattled position. Love and trust abounds in this army amongst the men and women who wear the uniform. And we have men like the chosen few, truly, to thank for that. And we have, perhaps most of all, as the President recounted yesterday, the duty the responsibility to learn the hard lessons, the inescapable lessons of that day, to better do our part, put forth every necessary, every conceivable resource for our soldiers, to provide them an equal measure of the effort, the incredible effort, of the love 
they so courageously bring forward on behalf of this nation each and every day, no matter what the mission. Today, Ryan has a new mission as a husband, father, and businessman, but he also remains a devoted witness to the valor of others, the valor of heroism, self-sacrifice, patriotism, and audacity that he has taught all of us through his extraordinary Army service. Those are things that are now being taught, by example, to his son, to his Nashua neighbors, to his civilian work colleagues at Oracle. Ryan, by the way, my staff recently spoke with the president of Oracle. We told you we'd always be checking up on you, so. The company's president, Mark Hurd, said, not surprisingly, Ryan is a humble leader who is well-liked and respected by his team. He has demonstrated leadership, dedication, and commitment to excellence, and we are very proud to have him as an Oracle employee. Some things never change, Ryan. We are so very proud of all that you've accomplished both on and off the battlefield. Competence, character, they never grow old. But nothing is important to Ryan as the family that he and Amy are raising up there in Nashua. As I mentioned, their wonderful son Lucas is certainly a testament to that. The bottle is finished and apparently Lucas has gone. But. <laughs> but I'm sure that once all of the whirlwind has settled down a bit, they'll be anxious to get back to Nashua and uh, back to their everyday lives. You know, I saw a photograph of Ryan and Amy's living room in some of the recent press coverage and couldn't help but notice that on one wall there was a total collage of family photos. And that wall was adorned with the words, love, laugh, live. Ryan has said Lucas will grow up knowing what his teammates did, that they, he will know their stories, that he will know his daddy is here, thanks to the love, the laughter, and the lives of a few good and chosen men. Men and women like those who, thanks be to God, still serve America's army. So Ryan, Amy, Luke, all your family, God bless you. God bless the memories and the families of our fallen and missing. God bless the United States and this glorious army that keeps her free. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Well, good morning, everyone. I must say that uh, following both uh, General Odierno and uh, Secretary McHugh is a hard, are two hard acts to follow. But uh, G Secretary McHugh, General Odierno, General Sullivan, Sergeant Major Chandler, distinguished member of his co uh, members of Congress, Gold Star families, members of the Medal of Honor Society, families of our veterans and the men and women who serve our country today in uniform, our civilian employees, and in particular, our very special guests here this, uh, this morning. On behalf of Secretary Hagel, I want to welcome and thank you all again uh, for being here today to honor the exceptional heroism of Staff Sergeant Pitts. I must say I've been fortunate in the first two months of being the uh, Deputy Secretary of being able to participate in three Medal of Honor cer ceremonies and two in this hall with the Army with Kyle White, and I must say, this is uh, among the most awesome things that I do and the things that I most enjoy doing. Both uh, Kyle White and Staff Sergeant Pitts saved, uh, served in the same co uh, company, chosen company, 2nd Battalion of the 503rd Infantry Regiment, 173rd Airborne Brigade, and who is also here with us today. Not bad, Airborne. Coming from a Marine, not bad at all. To all the members of Chosen Company, past and present, and here today, welcome. You truly are 
an impressive bunch of soldiers. I want to also offer a special welcome to Ryan's family, his wife Amy, who I've just had the pleasure of meeting, and their young son Lucas, who as the uh, Secretary said, uh, is out uh, on his speaking tour now. Uh, he's also extended family uh, who have joined us. Welcome and thank you all for the love and support that you have provided to Ryan over the years and for helping mold this extremely impressive soldier and man. Now, I know the dawning challenges that all of the military families face day in, day out. I was born into a military family, and for more than a decade, our military families have had to grapple with being unsure that their loved ones would return safe from deployment, and often repeated deployments. And the courage and resilience that these families have displayed represents the finest values of both the military and our great country. Now, I cannot do any better uh, than General Odierno in describing the battle that compelled Ryan Pitts to act above and beyond the call of Dewey. It is an account that is old as the American military, a combat outpost holding out against a fierce attack. Literally a handful of American troops facing down tough odds. American infantrymen, Army paratroopers surrounded and outnumbered. Now, all of those of you in the Army know that the Airborne is trained in this very mission to drop behind enemy lines, to be surrounded, to be cut off, and to rely only on each other. But Ryan takes his place in our Hall of Heroes because of his actions on that day in July 2008. And uh, it's hard for me not to get uh, emotional, but he exemplifies the qualities of the American soldier. To me, steadfast devotion to duty, tenacity in a fight, love and respect for each other, as Secretary McHugh so eloquently spoke about. The President, Secretary McHugh, and General Odierno have already told you about this fight, but I think all you need to take away is there were a lot of heroes that day, and Ryan Pitts was among the most uh, storied of them. Combat Outpost Kaler was an isolated outpost, Oaks OP Topside, which you've heard about where Ryan uh, Pitts fought, and where he held was even more isolated. Now, so for most of the troops in this longest war that our country has ever fought, insurgents have generally been just a shadowy foe. Uh, their signature weapon is the improved explosive device. They often fire from concealed positions and melt away. They use mortar rounds. They snipe from a distance. But that wasn't the case, as General Dierno told you, at Wanat. It was close quarters combat against an enemy that was aggressively pushing home its assault. They wanted, and they outnumbered the outpost by who knows, maybe 10 to 1. And they were hoping to overwhelm that outpost with sheer numbers and volume of fire. And they came very close to doing so. At one point during the firefight, an American soldier shouted the warning, they're inside the wire. And you could actually hear the enemy talking over the radio that Ryan Pitts was using. The soldiers were looking directly into the faces of their combatants. This really is about a battle of will. And our soldiers met the enemy's ferocity with their own. And just like their ancestors displayed on a Pennsylvania farmland, on the Pacific beaches and jungles, like the airborne soldiers at the Ardennes Forest and in the highlands of Vietnam, our soldiers prevailed. Wounded multiple times, alternating between throwing grenades, firing his weapon, calling in fire support, radioing for reinforcements. And I have to say, as an artilleryman, he's an artilleryman too. So this really makes me happy. But he continued to fight for his brothers who lay around them, and those who were still alive and fighting the enemy. They truly are a close-knit band of brothers, and because of what Ryan did that day, the bodies of all of the nine heroes that we've talked about today were saved from enemy hands. If it hadn't been for his bravery and determination, and those of all of them fighting alongside him, the position most certainly would have been overrun. That personal commitment to bring our soldiers home 
be they living or dead, goes to the very spirit of our fighting men and women. Now, Ryan's former company commander, Matthew Meyer, uh, spoke to Brian right after the fight. And Ryan told him that he thought that he was going to die, but he was going to do everything he could to keep the enemy away from the bodies of his comrades. So as Meyer emphatically recounted, when all looked lost, Ryan's actions saved the day. He did not give up. You all saw the movie Saving Private Ryan. This was Saving Ryan's Privates and all of the people around him. As we honor this fine American, we also recognize the honor and service and the sacrifice of those nine soldiers and all the other soldiers of Chosen Company who fought that day. And as Ryan said with his customary modesty, I didn't earn the medal, we all earned it. We also honored the millions of Americans who have served and continue to serve over the past 12 plus years of war. This is the longest period of prolonged combat in our history. I had the opportunity to travel to Afghanistan recently and see some of these outstanding young Americans who are putting their lives on the line every day and to protect our nation. But I see in this fine soldier and his brothers and sisters in arms, past and present, members of the most amazing fighting force this world has ever seen. Their dedication to duty, regardless of personal safety, embodies the very best traditions of the American military. This generation of America's fighting men and women have demonstrated by their actions that they are, in fact, a truly great generation. They stepped forward and volunteered in the time of war knowing and often hoping that they could go to combat and take the fight to the enemy. All they asked for was the honor of fighting for their country, and they gave us all they had in return, their blood, their sweat, and sometimes, unfortunately, their lives. Well, the price paid by our service members in lives and wounds in this long war has been steep. They have inspired the hearts of our countrymen, a deep sense of pride and patriotism. As Douglas MacArthur so memorably told the West Point cadets in his famous farewell speech, from one end of the world to the other, the American soldier has drained deep the chalice of courage. Now, as these wars draw to an end, millions of veterans will follow the example of Ryan Pitts, Kyle White, all the other Medal of Honor winners, and all of the other men and women who've served in our uh, country during this time of war. And they return to civilian life, like Ryan, and leave, lead meaningful wives and lives and contribute to their communities and their companies. And having served on the country on the field of battle, this generation of service members will continue to work hard to change our country for the better, whether they're in or out of uniform. Ryan, you brought great honor upon yourself, the fam your family, the United States Army, and the entire nation. I know, as I did with Kyle White, I think everyone knows that out of the millions of men and women who've served in uniform, less than 4,000 have been awarded the Medal of Honor as is our custom, whenever they walk into the room, regardless of your rank or position, we stand and salute. As I did with Kyle White, Ryan, I'd ask you to stand and face the audience, and I'd la ask everyone in uniform, and everyone who used to serve in uniform, to please stand and salute this great American hero. Hand salute. Thank you. Ryan, I can't tell you how proud I am of you, how Secretary Hagel is proud of you, the President, all Americans, everyone in this room, and everyone we represent. We are very grateful for your bravery, your service, and your sacrifice. Thank you, Ryan, to all of those who stood by you that day, to those who lost their lives, to all of the soldiers who are here, and to all of the soldiers around the globe who support our nation, may God bless you all. Thank you very much. Secretary McHugh, General Odierno, Sergeant Major of the Army Chandler, and Staff Sergeant and Mrs. Pitts will now join 
Deputy Secretary Work on stage for the induction ceremony. The President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, has awarded the name of Congress, the Medal of Honor to Sergeant Ryan M. Pitts. He distinguished himself by extraordinary acts of heroism at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as a forward observer in 2nd Platoon, Chosen Company, 2nd Battalion Airborne, 503rd Infantry Regiment, 173rd Airborne Brigade, during combat operations against an armed enemy at Vehicle Patrol Base, Kaler, in the vicinity of Why Not Village, Kunar Province, Afghanistan, on July 13th, 2008. Early that morning, while Sergeant Pitts was providing perimeter security at Observation Post Topside, a well-organized anti-Afghan force consisting of over 200 members initiated a close proximity, sustained and complex assault using accurate and intense rocket-propelled grenade, machine gun, and small arms fire on Why Not Vehicle Patrol Base. An immediate wave of rocket-propelled grenade rounds engulfed the observation post, wounding Sergeant Pitts and inflicting heavy casualties. Sergeant Pitts had been knocked to the ground and was bleeding heavily from shrapnel wounds to his arm and legs. With incredible toughness and resolve, he subsequently took control of the observation post and returned fire on the enemy. As the enemy drew nearer, Sergeant Pitts threw grenades, holding them after the pin was pulled and the safety lever was released to allow a nearly immediate detonation on hostile forces. Unable to stand on his own and near death because of the severity of his wounds and blood loss, Sergeant Pitts continued to lay suppressive fire until a two-man reinforcement team arrived. Sergeant Pitts quickly assisted them by giving up his main weapon and gathering ammunition, all the while continually lobbing fragmentary grenades until these were expended. At this point, Sergeant Pitts crawled to the northern position radio and described the situation to the command post as the enemy continued to try to isolate the observation post from the main patrol base. With the enemy close enough for him to hear their voices, and with total disregard for his own life, Sergeant Pitts whispered in radio situation reports and conveyed information that the command post used to provide indirect fire support. Sergeant Pitts's courage, steadfast commitment to the defense of his unit, an ability to fight while seriously wounded prevented the enemy from overrunning the observation post and capturing fallen American soldiers and ultimately preventing the enemy from gaming, gaining fortified position in higher ground from which to attack Why Not Vehicle Patrol Base. Sergeant Ryan M. Pitts's extraordinary heroism and selflessness above and beyond the call of duty are in keeping with the highest traditions of military service and reflect great credit upon himself, Company Charlie, 2nd Battalion, Airborne, 503rd Infantry Regiment, 173rd Airborne Brigade, and the United States Army. The War on Terrorism plaque will now be unveiled, inducting Sergeant Pitts into the Hall of Heroes.
At this time, Deputy Secretary Work will present the Medal of Honor flag. On 23 October 2002, Public Law 107-248, Section 8143, established the Medal of Honor flag to recognize service members who have distinguished themselves by gallantry in action above and beyond the call of duty. The Medal of Honor flag commemorates the sacrifice and bloodshed for our freedom and gives emphasis to the Medal of Honor being the highest award for valor by any individual serving in the armed forces of the United States. The light blue color with gold fringe bearing 13 white stars are adapted from the Medal of Honor ribbon. Thank you, Deputy Secretary of Work, Secretary McHugh, General Ordierno, Sergeant Major of the Army Chandler, and Mrs. Pitts. Ladies and gentlemen, Staff Sergeant Ryan Pitts. Deputy Defense Secretary of Work, Secretary McHugh, General Odierno, Sergeant Major Chandler, members of Congress, distinguished DOD civilian guests, general and flag officers, brothers and sisters in arms, Gold Star families, my family, ladies and gentlemen, and my fellow Medal of Honor recipients, good morning. And my lovely wife, Amy, I want to thank you for all your support. You're an amazing mom, wife, and woman. I love you. I stand here in awe of the men I served with. Many of them are here today. It was the honor of my life to answer the call and serve our country alongside the men of Chosen Company, The Rock, and all the service members. There were many factors that brought us together and motivated us to fight. For me, it was my love for our country and dedication to my brothers. In my combat experience, the latter is the one guiding principle that carries us through battle. It was the men to our left and right that compelled us to fight with everything we had. There was an absolute duty to be your brother's keeper, a sentiment that I think we all shared. My favorite quote that embodied our dedication is ironically captured in a brief passage from Stephen Pressfield's The Afghan Campaign. It reads, of one thing I'm certain, I will die before I let harm come to him. The shaft that impales him must first pass through my flesh. I saw the greatest men I have ever known personify this passage. Men who placed themselves between us and the enemy to protect and defend their brothers. Our fallen exemplified this most greatly as they fought to their last breaths to ensure the rest of us could return home. They are the real heroes, and it is their names you should know. Specialist Sergio Abad, Corporal Jonathan Ayers, Corporal Jason Bogar, First Lieutenant Jonathan Brostrom, Sergeant Israel Garcia, Corporal Jason Hovader, Corporal Matthew Phillips, Corporal Pruitt Rainey, and Corporal Gunners Willing. These men and so many others displayed extraordinary acts of valor that day. No one, man, no one man carried the fight. We did it together. Chavez was shot through both legs, helping pull a mortally wounded Abad to cover. Davis, Krupa, Hamby, 
Meyer grapes in Santiago manned critically important weapon systems that were heavily targeted by the enemy. Many men, including Soans and Meyer, exposed themselves to direct enemy fire to reload these weapon systems that were so important to our defense. One man picked up an unexploded missile that landed in a fighting position after being ejected from a destroyed vehicle. He ran the missile into the open so soldiers could continue to occupy the position in the process exposing himself to direct enemy fire. Denton stood and returned fire despite being wounded in both legs and his dominant right hand because he had to continue fighting. Bogar returned fire, stopping only to apply medical aid to me and others before returning to the fight. In the beginning moments of the fight, Matt Phillips immediately returned fire and threw a hand grenade to engage the enemy and repel their assault. Ayers was heavily targeted while continuously firing his machine gun in the face of an overwhelming volume of enemy fire, despite already being struck in the helmet by an enemy round. Lieutenant Brostrom and Hovader braved withering enemy fire, covering more than 100 meters to help reinforce and defend OP topside. Rainey helped manage the fight at OP topside, distributing ammo and shifting weapon systems. In the second wave of reinforcements, Samaru, Garcia, Denton and Soans maneuvered to save my life and depend, defend OP topside, where four paratroopers had been wounded and where Ayers, Bogar, Lieutenant Brostrom, Hovader, Phillips, Rainey and Zwilling had given their lives in our defense. They came to help me despite the danger of their own lives. Saving my life cost Garcia his own. You must ask yourself, how did these men do it? Or what compelled them to take these actions? Again, we return to our dedication to our brothers. We were a family whose bonds were forged in the fires of combat. Our brothers' lives were more important than our own. If they were in a fight, then we wanted to be there. They would never stand alone. I have seen so much valor displayed by my brothers that I cannot even begin to scratch the surface in the short time I have today. Rather, I will spend a lifetime telling their stories to honor their heroic deeds. This is a responsibility that accompanies the award, a responsibility that has been easier to accept knowing that the award belongs to every man I fought alongside. While the Medal of Honor is awarded to an individual, it has felt like anything but an individual achievement. It is ours, not mine. I will wear it for everyone there that day, especially those we couldn't bring home. The medal represents our sacrifices and those of every service member and it will forever serve as a memorial to the fallen. I will never view myself as a recipient, but always as a caretaker. The word hero often accompanies the award. I don't care for the term, I never have. It is a distinction I have always felt was, re was reserved for those that make the ultimate sacrifice. However, I am humbled and honored to look at my brothers and see men I consider my personal heroes men I look up to. To every man who fought that day, every man who came to our aid, every leader and peer I ever had, it has been the honor of my life to serve and fight alongside you and all the brothers we lost. My family and I cannot thank you enough for all you have done for me and our country. I owe you a debt I can never repay. I honor you. Please stand and be recognized. To the families and loved ones of Sergio Abad, Jonathan Ayers, Jason Bogar, Jonathan Brostrom, Israel Garcia, Jason Hovader, Matthew Phillips, Pruitt Rainey, and Gunnar Zwilling. I have thought about them and their sacrifices every day. I will for the rest of my life, and I am not alone. You raised, molded, and loved incredible men 
Many of the men present in this room are here because of their actions, actions that changed the, the course of history for us, actions that gave the rest of us a second chance. My son Lucas exists because of them, as do many other men's children. I promise that my son will grow up appreciating the sacrifices of men he never knew. I miss them dearly, but it is awe-inspiring that such men lived. They were professionals. They were warriors. Thank you, chosen few, The Rock. Thank you, Staff Sergeant Pitts. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and join in the singing of the Army song. The words to the Army song can be found in your program. March along, sing a song with the Army of the Free. Comes the brave, come the true, who had fought to victory. With the army and proud of our name, with the army and proudly proclaim, first to fight for the right and to bear the nation's might, and the army goes rolling along. Proud of all we have done, fighting till the battle's won, and the army goes rolling along. Then it's high, high, hey, the army's on its way. Come up the kid is not as strong. For wherever we go, you will always know that the army goes rolling along. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please pause for a moment at your seats to allow the official party to exit the auditorium. <laughs> 